Hello, my friend, and welcome to the 596th episode of the Sales Podcast. I'm Wes Schaefer, the Sales Whisperer, your host today, doing something a little bit different. Uh, it's a book review. I've done several of those in the past. This one is uh, called Stolen Focus, uh, Why You Can't Pay Attention and How to Think Deeply Again. Um, what I'm doing differently is sharing my screen and uh, recording this as I go through the review that I've done on uh, my website. So when I do these book reviews, I typically make um, a detailed outline uh, covering this. You know, I did this on the 12 week year uh, book review. I did it on pitch anything. Um, and this this is um, I don't know this book hit me. Yeah, the 12 week year hit me. Um, Oren Claff's book hit me in sales in a different way over 10 or 11 years ago. Um, but stolen focus it hits me in a different way because it's. I literally see it as an attack on us, an attack on individuals, on families, on societies, on children. Um, And I read through this thing a couple of times. It's a big book, several hundred pages. took a lot of notes. Uh, I've linked, I followed the outline in the book. And um, I just wanted to go through this and make sure I cover it, right? Make sure you understand how impactful this thing is. because. The things that are happening to us um, from an attention standpoint, it's, I literally see it as an attack. Um, I've been saying for years that we are in a cold civil war, certainly in America, uh, but this is happening around the globe, these social media and the things that we'll talk about. uh, But at least in America, and it's interesting that the author, uh, Johan, I think, Hari, um, is British, um, but he sees it. So it, it's a global phenomenon, In but at a minimum, approaching this as an American, I see this as an attack on our way of life, and I think we need to be discussing this book. So let's jump in, right? This is the outline, the increase in speed, switching and filtering, the crippling of our flow states the rise of physical and mental exhaustion, the collapse of sustained reading, the disruption of mind wandering, the rise of technology that can track and manipulate you, parts one and two, the rise of cruel optimism, the first glimpses of the deeper solution. And on those, yeah, I may not delve into as much, but uh, you know, I do want to, there is some hope, but we have uh, a daunting task in front of us. Uh, the surge in stress and how it is triggering vigilance, the places that figured out how to reverse the surge in speed and exhaustion, our deteriorating diets and rising pollution, the rise of ADHD and how we are responding to it, the confinement of our children, both physically and psychologically, and then the attention rebellion. So that's the outline, uh, and I'm going to be going through this for as long as it takes. Let's dive in. The increase in speed, switching, and filtering. Uh, I talked about this last week. Uh, I was in Alabama with a client, and I actually opened with this. I opened my copywriting course uh, a couple of weeks ago with this entire book review as well. But um, we are not CPUs. We cannot truly multitask. Uh, We're not multi-threaded. We have one brain. We can focus on one or two things. You know, we can keep a couple of things in our brains at once, but we're still switching quickly between them. Um, and so we are hurting ourselves thinking that we can do this, that we can multitask, that we can have multiple screens open, multiple tabs, multiple applications, multiple devices, uh, and actually do a good job on anything that's open in those. Um, one of the examples he gave in the book is uh, to defeat this is called pre-commitment. Uh, the example, one of the examples he gave was Homer's Odyssey, where Ulysses uh, had his crew tie him to the mast, uh, because the, the mermaids, the sirens of the sea would sing and, and pull you into the ocean to your death. So by pre-committing to not falling prey to that. He survived the temptation. So, and he gives examples in the books of applications you can use. Um, a, there's like a little lockbox kind of device you can drop your phone into and 
um, and, it, and it won't open unless you break it, you know, put a 15 minute timer, one hour timer, whatever. So I mean, there's different things. Um, and so that's fine. Uh, do what you must, uh, but understand that uh, the constant switching back and forth is hurting you. Um, talk about the haze of decompression, uh, how tough it is to, to truly decompress when there's so many things running in your brain back and forth. Um, gets into exhaustion and stillness. You know, he gave some interesting numbers that a vast majority of us are running around exhausted. We get into sleep deprivation and multiple things, multiple times in the book, he gets into exhaustion uh, and the problem of lack of stillness. We need some calm. We need, instead of brainstorming, more brain stilling in our lives. Uh, this speed and switching induces panic. And multiple times in the book, he talks about uh, this hyper vigilance, and you see it in in war veterans who kind of a before and after. You know, one year, two year, three years, whatever, four years, Civil War, uh, Revolutionary War, um, the that before and after, and and these veterans, these warriors look just ragged, uh, and it's that hyper vigilance. Uh, it's tough, right? And so it helps you survive a war. So when death is literally lurking around every corner, uh, it may be a good thing to be hyper. It is a good thing to be hyper vigilant. But are we at war in our day to day lives? Uh, many of us, our brains think we are. We're allowing it with what's going on in social media and technology and how it's manipulating us. Um, <clears throat> diving deeply or a focused amount of time induces perspective. And that's not happening very much. That's why people do not have a good perspective. We don't have a good grasp of the situation, of the facts. There's always a new emergency, a new bombshell report on a politician or whatever. And you can never get to the bottom of these things. You, there's not enough time. So you're doing yourself and the world a disservice by running around like this, by not allowing your time to focus on something deeply. Um, we need to slow down to give the receptors in our brains the chance to open up to more attention and connection. My advice to my clients uh, last week, and this is a very successful company growing rapidly, uh, doing over $80 million this year. Um looking to grow 40% next year. Uh, very successful, selling a complex sale. But I told them, you need some white spaces on your calendar. You need some time to brain still. Okay? Uh, in business and in sales, we must think something that is different from everyone else. Otherwise, why do our prospects need to talk to or buy from you? <clears throat> Now, we know from the Bible, there's nothing new under the sun, but there may be a new application, a new way to leverage something that comes across as new, at least gives a new benefit. Are you bringing that enlightenment, that better perspective to your prospects and clients? If you're just like everybody else, why should they even talk to you, let alone buy from you? Um, so. In today's day and age, things wreak peak popularity faster and they drop faster. So the world's becoming more and more like Twitter, um, be that as it may. Uh, we can't handle the volume of information, which is why we feel exhausted. Depth takes time, reflection, energy, commitment, none of which are we doing. Zuckerberg alone controlling you with a virtual reality headset on. So he gave an example when uh, Zuckerberg was demonstrating it, and everybody in the room had these headsets on except him. He's literally pulling everybody's strings. It's like eerie. It's freaky. It's not good. Um, he says it's an upper class of people who are aware. And then the rest of the world living in a virtual life, manipulated by the elite, 
Uh, we know Steve Jobs didn't let his kids use the tools and toys that he made. Many technologists do not allow their children to use the toys and tools that they make because they know how dangerous they are. Interesting, huh? Um, it's an ongoing battle. Yep. What makes us happy is doing something that is a little bit difficult. We've got to stretch a little bit. You know, if you're just taking up mountain climbing or rock climbing, you don't just go out to, to Everest, right? Or Half Dome. Uh, you need to do something just a little bit tougher, push you just a little bit more. Um, as you increase your speed, you decrease your comprehension. So slow down, understand what's going on, and push yourself a little bit more. When you increase speed, it decreases desire to engage with challenging material. So you can see how all of this is kind of tied together, right? So we even walk and talk faster today than several years ago. Slowness nurtures attention. Speed shatters it. We are deluded. We are single-minded. We cannot multitask, as I mentioned before. We can only think about one or two things at a time. As I said, juggling comes at a cost. One of them is the switch cost effect. It takes time to go from one thing to the other and get back up to speed. Okay. The, the effect on intelligence, he said, affects you up to 10 IQ points. So, which is twice the loss of smoking pot. So when you're, uh, they gave people IQ tests and one, they let just focus the other, they made them multitask. The multitaskers were 10 points lower. They, you could literally smoke marijuana two times over and score just as well. Uh, he said, there's the screw up effect, right? You just, you mess up more. Uh, it's a creativity drain. You need to give your brain time to follow your associative links down to new places to have really, to really have original and creative thoughts. There's a diminished memory effect. Um, so you, you're not as creative, takes more time, makes you dumber, um, and you can't remember things. You perform 20 to 30% worse when you are interrupted when taking a test. Distracted drivers are nearly as bad as drunk drivers with one in five car accidents now due to distracted driving. So he's mentioning that just to give you a point of reference. It's not good what we're doing to ourselves. Respect your mind's limitations. You'll feel better and mentally restored. Your brain is like a muscle. You can improve your focus, but you must distance yourself from the distractions. Willpower is not enough. And we'll get into that cruel optimism I mentioned earlier. That was something new that, that I learned in this, uh, and it's powerful. Uh, the prefrontal cortex wards off unimportant things, but it's getting overwhelmed. Noise pollution is real. The crippling of our flow states. Um, I have been an athlete for a long time. And before I really knew what this was, um, I, you know, you'd have a good game and I guess technically you were in that flow state It's when things just flow, they just work. Uh, time passes quickly. Uh, the things you do bring, uh, enjoyment, pleasure, satisfaction, uh, and you do them without thinking about it. Um, and so, you know, he's got a good point here in that we are crippling our flow states. He says, everyone is broadcasting, but not receiving. Uh, very true. Uh, you'll interrupt yourself if you are set free, if you've been interrupted for too much of your life. That's why you, you try to buckle down, you try to focus and boom, you're pulled into doing laundry, right? <laughs> doing crazy chores, uh, doing things that you wouldn't normally do, um, scrolling through social media, right? Um, it's you've got to be aware of these interruptions, and this book, you know, this podcast, hopefully, will help you be aware of these things and and start to put into play, into practice, ways to stop it, to counter it. You know, because he says nature abhors a vacuum. 
And as a meteorologist and taking all my engineering classes at the Academy, Air Force Academy, um, you know, we studied turbulent versus laminar flow and good things like that. And nature does abhor a vacuum. You will fill up the space that is created. Um, so if you set all the noisy stuff aside, you must fill it with something. Okay, so it's not enough to just get rid. I can't, this guy, he he took three months off. He left England, uh, went out to the tip of uh, Cape Cod, and for three months he he left his smartphone with a friend. He had to go buy this like dummy phone, you know, basically like literally to use only on emergencies. Found an Airbnb with no internet connection, uh, no TV. Brought a bunch of books, and for three months just disconnected. And he talks about how how hard it was to get back into a groove of reading and writing. This guy is an author, right? And he had uh, fallen out. He had, he had forgotten how to create these flow states. So it's not enough to just get rid of the noise. You'd have to know how to fill it with uh, something good, okay, with information, with, with good productive things. Um, you know, most of us feel most alive when we're doing something difficult. And again, not something impossible, but something that stretches us a little bit. Um, B.F. Skinner was a psychologist. Um, he referenced him a good bit in the book. Um, he references, describes how social media companies reference and build on the studies of B.F. Skinner. Uh, but again, he's somebody that showed you can control one's focus and attention. He demonstrated it with birds uh, and with rats, getting them to do stupid little tasks for food, these little dopamine hits. That's what's happening to us on social media with likes and shares and comments. Um, it's it's crushing us, and it's all by design. Uh, you know, Instagram engineers applied this thinking to make their app sticky. Um Artists get into a deep state of focus where time seems to fall away, as I mentioned. Uh, when they complete their work, the artist sets it aside. They start over again, right? They're, they're not seeking accolades or even money. Maybe that's why you have a bunch of broke artists, uh, but they love making art. And maybe they need someone to help them uh, promote the art. But the point is, you know, when they studied them, their brains and, and their pleasure receptors and whatnot, it all fired, you know, lit up in their brain when they were creating. So the purpose of flow is to keep on flowing. Flow states are the highlights of our lives. And think about how long it has been maybe since you were in that flow state. Maybe that correlates to why... You're not happy right now. You're not satisfied. If we can drill down, there's a plethora of focus inside ourselves that can carry us through tough situations and make it painless, even pleasurable. Relaxing will not get you into that state. Have a defined goal, right? Focus, not multitasking. Do something meaningful. Work on something on the edge of your abilities, but not beyond them. We live in a world dominated by technologies based on Skinner's view of how the human mind works which I already talked about, the dancing chickens, right? You can train living creatures to desperately crave arbitrary well, rewards. Napoleon knew this a couple hundred years ago. You know, he said a quote, something to the effect of, like, it, it's almost no limit, right? It's, it's amazing what you can get men to do, the risks you can get men to take for a little piece of colored ribbon. We'll be happier and healthier if we create the right circumstances to let our powerful internal forces flow. We can focus for long stretches and enjoy it, believe it or not. We are irritated and diminished when we are distracted. Flow states are fragile and easily disrupted. Uh, and as I mentioned before, it's not enough to remove the bad. We must add good and strive for it. Otherwise, what is the purpose of life? Find your flow to break the pull of distraction. Flow carries you through the difficult patches and the frustrations. Give yourself the gift of flow early in the day and feel relaxed and optimistic the rest of the day. Healing your brain is possible. Fragmentation shrinks us 
flow expands us. The next chapter is the rise of physical and mental exhaustion. We live on the permanent edge of exhaustion. Get enough rest so you don't need coffee to feel awake and alert. I don't know about that. I mean, coming from the deep south, my cousin owns a coffee company. All right, maybe a little. All right, but I digress. Stop living by the rhythms of machines. Sleep without chemicals to dream more vividly. Then you can think more clearly. Sleep is not purely passive. It's an important part of our lives. It is quite active when we sleep. Our brains, right, are quite active. There's the biomechanical feedback and reward and benefit to getting good sleep. You can't focus when you are sleepy. Being awake 19 hours makes you as cognitively impaired as being drunk. 40% of Americans are chronically sleep deprived. Children have lost 85 minutes of sleep in the last century. <clears throat> That's why I'm glad we homeschooled for so many years. Most of our kids let them sleep in and focus on things when they were ready to focus on them. Uh, and they've all turned out well. Crazy how we push our kids, but it, I think it's a, it's a reflection of how we push ourselves. Local sleep kicks in when you're tired, i.e. part of your brain is asleep, but you appear to be awake. Adults become drowsy, but children become hyperactive. We'll talk about that later in the book. Typical college students have the same, the same, same sleep quality as an active duty soldier or a parent of a newborn. How about them apples, huh? Students are sleep deprived since puberty. Being sleep deprived makes your body shift into the sympathetic nervous system zone. Your body thinks you're in an emergency, raises your blood pressure, makes you crave junk food and sugar for fast energy, raises your heart rate. This hurts both short and long-term focus. This stifles creativity and memory. We're all sleep deprived and we block our body's ability to detect the adenosine, I think, in our body with caffeine that tells us we're sleepy. So we end up with symptoms of ADHD. We're all rushing around, impulsive, easily irritated in traffic. Sleep improves our moods, addresses obesity issues, and concentration. Sleep deprivation may lead to dementia. Sleeping, taking sleeping pills increases your risk of death from all causes. Electric light has scrambled our internal rhythms. We evolved to get a surge of waking drive as the sun sets. It's helpful to build a campfire or set up a tent or get back to camp before darkness sets in. This is artificially created as we watch TV, surf the web, etc. So I hope you understand what, what that's saying. So as you know, our ancestors, cavemen, uh, folks crossing the prairies. Um, that light, you know, towards the end of the day gives us a little boost so we can wrap up, um, shore up everything, right? Secure a campsite and be protected. When, and, and it lasts for hours. So when you are watching TV, looking at your iPhone, right up, until the moment of sleep. That's why you stay up later and later and later. You, you see blog posts. Oh, it's time to go to bed. Oh, here I am at you know 3 a.m. on my phone. You got to put these things down. Turn the electronics off and get some true rest. Um, but here's part of the problem. Sleep is a big problem in the world of consumer capitalism. These big companies want us awake. They want us consuming. They want our attention. They want our agitation, our focus. We need less light in our bedrooms and need to avoid looking at screens for two hours before bed. We need to change our relationship with our phones. It's not our baby. It doesn't need our constant attention and care. Sleep in a cool room. Why can't we do the obvious, i.e. slow down, sleep more, focus on one thing at a time? It's a good question, huh? Next chapter is the collapse of sustained reading. I only read the first chapter or two. I can't focus. The buzz of online conversations pulls us from prolonged 
focused reading. 57% of Americans do not read a book in a given year. The average American spends 17 minutes reading and 5.4 hours on their phones. We can get into flow by reading if we'd only allow ourselves to. Reading books trains us to read in a linear, focused, sustained fashion. Reading from screens trains us to read in a manic manner, skipping and jumping around. We now skim and rush and create a different relationship with reading. It's no longer pleasurable or immersive. I'm doing some edits here as I'm, as I'm reading through this. Um, it's screen inferiority. You know, I, I do have some books on my iPad and Kindle. Uh, it does make it convenient when traveling. Um, but the bulk of my reading is still on paper, right? Holding them in my hand. I got some cool ice. I got a little little book stand thingy right here that uh, I've had for a few months, a couple months now. And I uh, love it. It's a little wooden thing and it tilts and it's got two arms and can uh, keep the pages open. So I set this on my desk uh, as I'm reading and I can take notes on my computer uh, at the same time. So making these blog posts. But anyway, uh, we absorb less when we see the stuff on the screen. We're losing our ability to read long texts. We're losing our cognitive patience and the stamina and the ability to deal with cognitively challenging texts. Even Harvard professors are turning to YouTube and podcasts. The medium is the message. We see things through the filter and the goggles of the medium. Twitter, don't focus on any one thing for too long. Don't go too deep. Master things quickly and confidently. Success means quick, broad appeal, and agreement. Facebook, your life exists to be on display, and your edited highlights should be immediately liked. Those who do this repeatedly are your, quote, friends. Instagram, how do you look on the outside is all that matters, period. Oh, and that people like how you look on the outside. These messages are wrong, which is why we feel wrong after spending so much time on these platforms. Perhaps deeply reading fiction is a kind of empathy gem by immersing yourself into their worlds. The more novels you read, the better you are at reading the emotions of others. How about them apples, huh? Becoming more empathetic is a powerful tool. Children grow in empathy if they are read to, watch longer movies, but not short shows. All right, so that is interesting. Adults can grow in empathy by watching a longer TV series. So I guess with Yellowstone, everyone is becoming empathetic. Although Beth and them are kind of tough. So I don't know. We shall see. We internalize the texture of the voices we're exposed to. So think about that, right? What voices are you exposed to on Twitter, on Facebook, on Reddit and forums? Are you, these echo chambers, are they beating each other up? Are they harsh? Are they critical? Things to consider. Next, the disruption of mind wandering. William James, I think he was a, a Google dude. I think I've got notes here later. Uh, he wrote, everyone knows what attention is, which can be good, can be bad. Uh, but we need to we need to set our minds free, turn them loose, let them wander and find crazy, quote unquote, crazy connections. Our, quote, sane, rational, conscious, focused mind wouldn't dare make. That's what I was saying. You, you need to give yourself time to rest, to come up with these new connections, to, to have a new angle, a new twist when you're prospecting, selling, marketing. Uh, otherwise, why should I buy from you? Why should I even listen to you? Got to give yourself some time to wander. The default mode network is the part of the brain that is when it is waiting for instructions or when you are daydreaming. Give yourself time to allow your mind and thoughts to float freely. First, you are slowly making sense of the world. Mind wandering will help you have more organized personal goals, be creative, make patient long-term decisions. Next, 
you'll start to make new connections between things, which often produces solutions to your problems. Great breakthroughs often happen during periods of mind wandering. Creativity is not the creation of something brand new. It's a new association of things that were already there. Mind wandering is not just being distracted. It's a mental time travel. It's a different and necessary form of attention. Loose patterns of association can lead to unique insight. Give your brain time to digest what you've fed it. Our constant switching between tabs and skimming is neither focused nor mind-wandering. It's just an unsatisfying whir. This suppresses any train of thought you might have created. It's hard to make sense of the world like this. When we're tired and confused, we're more vulnerable to the next fad or distraction. Learning to think is more than learning how to focus. We've trained ourselves to believe that a wandering mind is an unhappy mind. That is not the case, right? We allow ourselves to ruminate, to get stressed out, to become anxious now. When you have low stress and safety, mind wandering is a gift. I guess I should say low stress and high safety, or when you're feeling, when you're safe and don't have stress, mind wandering is a gift, a pleasure, creative force. When checking his email after three months, the world had accepted his absence with a shrug. Email breeds email. If you stop, it stops. So, you know, the author was talking about that. He, he had his, you know, and again, he's an author and he admits he's he's in an interesting position. Not everybody can just get up and, and leave for three months, right? But that's not even the solution. But he did notice, you know, to a very large degree, we feed into the chaos that we bemoan and despise and hope to escape from. The mania, the demands on your time make you feel important. Complexity and compassion of normal, deep life are replaced with snarky, crude, and mean comments on social media. I am super snarky. I know I'm working on it. We get a sense of affirmation and approval when we are liked, shared, and commented upon by others online. These are all strangers for the most part, and it's all fleeting. But anyway, but they want you to think it's all your fault that you're weak, that your efforts to stay deep and focused are fragile and futile. <laughs> Aren't they some lovely people, huh? Ah, the rise of technology that can track and manipulate you. Part one. He's got to do two parts because this is so pervasive, so sneaky, so destructive. Um, he So James Williams, former Google engineer, is quoted as saying, you know, a digital detox is as effective as wearing a gas mask twice a week to fight pollution. Like, ouch. It's unsustainable, doesn't address the root issue and systemic issues. An individual is limited in what they can do against the environment. Tristan Harris, former Google engineer, and um, he was part of the Social Dilemma movie, um, is also quoted in this and, and interviewed quite extensively. Um, and they give insight into this, the destructive nature of social media and how it affects our attention. He learned magic as a boy and that it's really about the limits of attention. So this is Tristan Harris. And and it's true. My father-in-law does magic. We um, we went up to the mountains here, Big Bear, outside of L.A. Uh, two weekends ago, like 24 of us. And uh, in-laws, kids, grandkids, and the great-grandkids. And he did a little magic show. And when you know the tricks, it's like, it's so simple. It's, it's not entertaining. You know, it's fun to see the reaction of the kids, but the tricks are quite simple, a lot of them. And it's literally getting someone to just look away while you hide the ball, or whatever. It's just, but that that's what's happening with uh, with social media. But 
you know, as Tristan says, the magician manipulates your focus. It's not about intelligence. It's more subtle. It's about our weaknesses, our limits, our blind spots, our biases, biases that trap all of us. We are fallible in predictable ways. A magician can turn you into his puppet. They don't have to know your strengths, just your weaknesses. Stanford 2002 Persuasive Technology Lab, Professor B.J. Fogg. Computers may become far more persuasive than humans. The Psychology of Mind Control course. Books based on the philosophy of B.F. Skinner, who got pigeons and rats to act based on the right reinforcement. So that's what this professor, B.J. Fogg, was studying. Um, And these guys ended up creating Instagram, getting bought by Facebook. uh, And the same technology has gone into all these social media sites. Um, so Tristan was excited, but didn't realize the ethical components of this, right? This is Tristan Harris. So he, he's working on all this and, you know, he's young, right? Stanford and, and the internet was pretty young. Social media, I don't think really even existed. I don't think in 2002. Um, so they go into this with, with altruistic goals and ideals and then stuff gets interesting. So he and Mike Krieger launched Instagram. What if you had a profile of every single person on earth, a deep profile, a psychological profile? How could you target them? Think Donald Trump and Cambridge Analytica. This is horribly concerning, he said. Imagine a control room with 100 people hunched over dials, controlling the thoughts and feelings of a billion people. This was Google in 2011. And now, Google, Facebook, et cetera, measure success by your engagement. Your distraction is their fuel. Instagram filters lead people to get cosmetic surgery to look like their filters. I'm concerned about how we're making the world more distracted. We're living on a treadmill of continuous checking. The average person who clicks on a photo is pulled away for 20 minutes. Humans make different decisions when we pause and consider. But if these devices and these apps are so inductive or, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Inducing, um, addictive, uh, manipulative, and they pull you in. Uh, we're going to talk about here in a little bit the infinite scroll. Uh, with, There's no pause and no consideration. We just keep going and going and going. We're literally hypnotized to a degree. So we just keep going. Socrates said writing things down would ruin our memories. So people always panic when new tech is introduced. So this is the argument like, oh, relax. You know, everybody's freaking out. Even Socrates freaked out. New technology, new new abilities, new tools, you know, it's all okay. Mm -hmm. But uh, he became Google's first design ethicist. Snapchat streaks hook teens. When he gave a recommendation, though, Facebook, et cetera, you know, uh, Zuckerberg said, your recommendation is at odds with our bottom line. And they literally said, don't bring this stuff back to us. Many Silicon workers ban their kids from using the tech they design. I already talked about that. Uh, But companies do not have the right incentive to change. Aza Raskin's father, Jeff Raskin, invented the Apple Macintosh for Steve Jobs. Aza was the creative lead on Firefox, and he created Infinite Scroll. He thought it would increase our speed and efficiency. Now we're hooked scrolling through crap. Now every day, a total of 200,000 more human lifetimes are spent scrolling through a screen. He feels, quote, sort of dirty for inventing this. Making something easy to use doesn't mean it's good for humanity. Are we making technology that tears us? rips us and breaks us. 
He saw people becoming more unempathetic, angry, and hostile as their social media usage went up. What social media really sells is the ability to grab and hold attention. The Texas and Silicon Valley are kids. They're making toys that end up conquering the world. They seek to mediate in order to fight the programs they created. Workshops on, quote, mindfulness are popular at Google and Facebook. How to make mental space to make decisions proactively while perpetrating non-mindfulness. Sean Parker, an early investor in Facebook and a hacker, saw them seek to consume as much of your time and conscious attention as possible. They exploit a vulnerability in human psychology. They knew it and they did it anyway. Uh, Chamath Palahapitaya, Facebook's VP of growth, said the effects are so negative that his own kids aren't allowed to use that shit. Tony Fidel, co-inventor of the iPhone, wakes up in cold sweats thinking, what did we bring to the world? He's worried he helped create a, quote, nuclear bomb that can blow up people's brains and reprogram them. How many of you want to live in the world you are designing? Silence. That was a question James Williams posed um, while speaking to hundreds of leading tech designers. Silence. Interesting, huh? The rise of technology that can track and manipulate you. Part two. Facebook won't show you the physical proximity of your friends. I did notice that Snapchat does that. That's pretty cool. Facebook wants your attention and they want to scan, sort, and store what you send, post, and search. <laughs> They're building a profile on you to sell to advertisers. Imagine a little voodoo doll of you at Facebook and Google, etc. They have a doll like that for one in four humans on earth. They maybe are not listening, but their models of us are so accurate that it's making predictions about what to show us. The tech they give us for free is to improve the voodoo doll, i.e. maps. The Echo and Next are sold below cost so they can monitor you. It's surveillance capitalism, says Harvard professor Shoshona Zuboff. KFC wants you to eat more chicken, and these sites want you to spend more time on them. It's business, right? This design to grab our attention is not inevitable. Silicon Valley chose to treat us like this, and we allowed them to do it. This is not a pro-tech or anti-tech debate. Silicon Valley execs and techs intentionally stole our attention. So what tech do we need? What is it designed for, and who benefits? Facebook has algorithms that vary all the time in order to keep you hooked. As humans, we'll stare at outrageous negative things a lot longer. It's called negativity bias. So on YouTube, include in, include in your title words like hates, obliterates, slams, destroys. You'll get more views. And that's not YouTube. That's just human nature, right? We, we like to see a car wreck. So that's on us. An NYU study showed that when you use words of moral outrage, your retweet rate will go up by 20%. So use words like attack, bad, and blame. Fill your Facebook posts with indignant disagreement to double your likes and shares. If it's more enraging, it's more engaging. Do this long enough to enough people and you change the culture. You turn hate into a habit. The algorithms reward fury and penalize mercy and harm our attention in six ways. Dun, 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 dun. Number one. They train our brains, they train our minds to crave frequent rewards. They push you to switch tasks more often, which erodes the quality of your thinking as if you were drinking or getting high. They learn how to frack you, i.e. drill into your, your attention. They make you angry often, which decreases the depth of your processing. They make you feel surrounded by angry people. Thus, you become hypervigilant. So you don't do slower forms of focus like reading or playing with your kids. They set society on fire. 
we pay attention together as a society. Social media sites are harming our collective attention. So we can't come together to tackle major issues. The algorithms spread outrageous information faster than the truth. It's forcing us to focus on nonsense. When we are lost in lies and always angry, we can't discern the truth. This means life will become more dangerous. YouTube wants you outraged as well. So they'll show you shocking, outrageous videos as an option. So no matter where you start, you end up more crazy. YouTube is radicalizing people. We don't just have a few bad apples. We're producing bad apples. These algorithms are debasing the soil of society. Social media is intentionally steering us away from our destination. It's a human downgrading, say Tristan and Aza. We're in the process of reverse engineering ourselves, says Aza. We're upgrading machines and becoming less rational, less intelligent, less focused. It's like Dr. Frankenstein. His friends at other major sites say they're not sure why their algorithms are making the, re the recommendations they are making. The machines are literally starting to take over. We've downgraded our attention spans, our capacity for complexity and nuance, our shared truth, our common sense, and the system is built to make things worse. Hmm. How about that? The Rise of Cruel Optimism. Near Yeol, uh, author of Indestructible, was interviewed to open this chapter. Um, he talks about how our kids are learning that whatever is on our phones is more important than them. He gave a story of how he was, like his child wanted to play or read to him or something. He says, yeah, yeah, in just a minute. And, you know, and when he finally looked up, his kid was gone. So that was, you know, indirectly or even directly. His kid's like, okay, whatever's on that phone is more important than me. So... We get out of shape when we eat our feelings. The food is not the problem. It's the underlying feeling we're hiding from. And the food is just the outlet. Why are we drawn to use these devices and apps so compulsively? Individual changes are the first line of defense. It starts with a little introspection. We must understand ourselves. It's not your fault, but fixing things is your responsibility. That's the beginning of cruel optimism. What's your internal trigger? The moments in your life that push you to do bad habits. What are those? It's an uncomfortable emotional state. Now, that's true. There is something triggering in us, something lacking, something we see that's incomplete. And we react and we go to the social media. Study them non judgmentally and find out how to disrupt your triggers. Like I, uh, I put in here, you know, like the dog whisperer tapping the dogs who are on edge. You'll see that the dog's like looking around, like ready to attack or getting spooled up. And, and the dog whisperer now goes by Caesar Milan or Milan's way or Caesar's way because he got divorced. So his wife, he and his ex-wife uh, were owners of that trademark. So they married. All right. You're going to lose your, your assets and your ass. But um, anyway. If you go watch the old episodes or uh, probably current episodes, I haven't watched in a while, but you'll see him, you know, go, he makes a little sound. It'll tap the dog on the neck, you know, and the head, whatever, and distract him, like snap him out of that. Similarly, we can interrupt and break our habits. Adopt the 10 minute rule. Wait 10 minutes to look at your phone when you get the urge. Block or batch your time. And that's good advice. I gave that advice Friday to my a uh, room full of sales clients, you know, batch your efforts. Uh, turn off notifications on your phone and computers. Delete most of the apps off your phone. Unsubscribe from email newsletters. Check email at set times. Two thirds of people with a smartphone never change their notification settings. Come on, people. Plan your day. Ask yourself, what do I actually want to do with my time? But the tech firms are in agreement with near. I hope it's near. NIR. They want us thinking this loss of focus issue is our problem, not theirs. We need more self-restraint, not the tech firms. That's what they want us to believe, right? 
Nir Eyal also wrote book Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products a few years earlier. Interesting, huh? He's kind of playing both ends against the middle. It's a cookbook with a recipe for human behavior. We are users of apps, just like a junkie is a user of drugs. It's mind manipulation meant to give us a craving. The designers want to create internal triggers that keep us coming back again and again. They create the user persona and design around their fears. Our tech habits may help us, but they surely help the bottom line of the developers. There are big, powerful forces striving to get us fiendishly hooked and in pain until we get our next tech fix. But Nier wants us to use some gentle personal changes to beat them and free ourselves. Cruel optimism per Ronald Purser, professor of management at San Francisco State University, first coined by historian Lauren Berlant. You give people with big issues hope, optimism, that they can tackle their huge issues, but it's cruel because your solution is limited and ignores the deeper causes, so it will fail. Let them eat cake. Let them be present. The ugly after effect of cruel optimism is when the small, cramped, limited solution fails, as it will most times, the individual won't blame the system. He'll blame himself. It becomes a form of victim blaming. We shouldn't have to go deep into ourselves to solve the problems intentionally created by these mega companies. Amen. We shouldn't have to accept this environment as the norm. We've become obese in much the same way. Our food is crap. Stress is through the roof. Comfort eating, eating is a thing. Our cities are hard to bike or walk around. So we gained 24 pounds as a society between 1960 to 2002. Now, the diet industry makes us blame ourselves. They are right, but this is a limited approach. 95% of people who lose weight on a diet regain the weight in one to five years. We have no systemic analysis. So when you end your diet and you're still deep in the unhealthy environment that led you to gain weight in the first place, you gain the weight back. Dun, dun, dun. So now he gets into the first glimpses of the deeper solution. And this, I don't know, uh, it's not as vital, I guess, for the sales podcast. Um, but it is interesting. You know, he talks about banning surveillance capitalism. You see Elon Musk maybe sort of trying it with the $8 a month verification, but you can still use the app without paying. Uh, if people paid for social media and it was mandated, you know, this could happen. And, and I've always been a, a big proponent of small government, but I'm not a proponent of no government. So having the government step in could make sense, right? Banning surveillance capitalism. It would hurt the social media companies if it forced them to change their business model. But could it save society? Could it save you and me? Yeah, maybe. But, uh, you know, he brings up some points like we banned lead paint. We banned CFCs. Uh, we banned the selling of human organs. Well, of course, unless you're Planned Parenthood and those baby destruction mills, women buying Lamborghinis with the money, but I digress again. Um, Microsoft was deemed a monopoly in 2001, broken up. They survived. Um, make these social media platforms become subscription models. Uh, now, this guy, again, he's British. He says, oh, they could take it over and run them like public utilities like the BBC. But I don't know about that. Um, other things, you know, they could batch your notifications to once per day, like a newspaper. Turn off the infinite scroll. Okay. Turn off recommendations on YouTube. That's interesting. I can just do a search, right? Find things. Uh, show our nearby friends so we can meet offline. Uh, they could help you limit your time based on your own personal limits. Uh, instead of being set up to grab your attention and sell it to the highest bidder, social media could be set up to understand your intentions and help you achieve your goals. But you'd have to be a paying member, right? Because their whole business model is built around engagement. In the spring of 2020, Facebook created an internal team called Common Ground that reached a definite conclusion. Our algorithms exploit the human brain's attraction to divisiveness and 
Our recommendation systems grow the problem of people becoming radicalized. Facebook dismissed and even mocked the findings as eat your veggies. If Facebook literally won't stop promoting fascism, it must be stopped by us. Interesting. The surge in stress and how it is triggering vigilance. The business model behind our technology is the main issue, not the technology itself. I agree. 48% of people surveyed say stress is the number one reason for their lack of focus and attention. 48% also said a change in life circumstances is leading to stress. Right? 43% say poor sleep. Sexual abuse wrecks kids. Duh. But they get misdiagnosed and put on ADHD meds. Hypervigilant vigilance is not good for us. Childhood trauma is wrecking our kids. Financial issues at home, serious illness in the family, court appearance by parents, etc. Kids need to feel safe to focus in school. No duh. Ritalin does not treat sexual assault. So the reason he brings this up is he gave some specific examples. Kids were acting up. They were misdiagnosed. Uh, they were being abused at home. And so I'm just glad I was brought up in an age before all of this. I would have been given HD, ADHD meds. You know, I didn't have ADHD. I was bored. School was not challenging me. I was a bright kid. School needs to change. Teachers need to change. So I'm, we homeschooled most of our kids for most of their years. Um, it's just got a shit show going on in our education system. But I digress. Um, where was I? Oh, a Buddha saying, be grateful for your suffering because it allows you to empathize with the suffering of others. You know, the old adage is make your misery your ministry. Small, short doses of stress can help us perform better. Long-term stress is not good. It can lead to insomnia. The middle class is collapsing. 60% of Americans have less than $500 in savings. IQ scores go up 13 points when you're not stressed about money. We're working an extra month per year compared to the average worker in 1969. Amen. I agree. And again, coming at this from a free market, capitalist, conservative, small government uh, proponent. Um, I do see how out of balance, out of whack we are now uh, in business. I see the benefits of some government intervention. Um, we're already paying for so many things like through uh, Medicare and Medicaid, things like that. California's got Medi-Cal. So we already have these social nets. Can it can the money be redistributed? I mean, because that's the problem. The, the powerful people in business abuse their power for profits. And the same humans, we put them in government. Just because they're in government doesn't mean that all of a sudden they're benevolent. Power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. So um, how do we find the happy balance? I don't know. But there's got to be a way. Our current system is failing. Okay. So he gave some examples of the places that figured out how to reverse the surge in speed and exhaustion. Uh, he quoted a guy named Andrew Barnes. I sacrificed my 20s on the altar of ambition. And later in life, I probably sacrificed my family. Average British worker was only actually engaged with their job for under three hours per day. So this guy, Andrew Barnes, he ran Perpetual Guardian in New Zealand. He started a four-day work week. During World War I, a munitions factory in Britain increased production when they switched to a six-day work week from seven days a week. When Andrew Barnes did this, he noticed they spent 35% less time on social media during work. Engagement, teamwork, and stimulation at work increased 30 to 40%. Stress decreased 15%. W.G. Kellogg, Kellogg cereal, in 1920s Britain went to a six-hour day from eight hours, and workplace accidents dropped 41%. In 2019 in Japan, Microsoft went to a four-day week, and productivity increased 40%. People are tired and they're goofing off when they're focused and things are compact. 
and they know it's never, it's not never ending. They know they're going to get a break. They're going to work harder. I've seen it. Toyota in Gothenburg, Sweden, cut two hours per day off the work week. And their mechanics produced 114% of what they were doing before that. And profits increased 25%. If you want your favorite sports team to win, you want them rested before they play. It's easy for cruel optimism to take over with all of this advice. Workers first began striking for better working hours in Philadelphia in 1791. They were beaten and fired, but by 1835, they were organized and pushed for the eight-hour day. Companies must be compelled to do the right thing. True, government officials must be compelled to do the right thing as well. That's my input. Bring back unions so workers can bargain and not be left hanging out to dry in the gig economy. He says this needs more debate and consideration, but it could help. It could have been my notes. I don't know on that one, but that's my thought. You know, again, we take a good thing too far. 100, 200 plus years ago. Yeah. Unions were great. Uh, Monopolies and, and just crazy work environments. You know, the, the big robber barons, if you will, uh, pushed people too far and uh, people had to fight back within the unions. It becomes this incestuous thing, right? The unions collect all these dues and then they contribute to politicians who will support their causes. Politicians write laws that support them. The rich get richer, including union bosses. Okay, so it's not like there's some utopian thing. So everything needs its checks and balances. But could unionizing some people, giving them more benefits, helping them with health care, making health care portable, helping people with retirement accounts. People don't know how to invest. You know, can you bring back a pension or some type of managed retirement? Uh, it's needed. That's just my own input. But uh, I digress. Uh, he touts the $15 minimum wage as a success. I would disagree with that. They get a $1 minimum wage. You know, you're not supposed to work at minimum wage forever. But it's hard for somebody to hire someone when they need too much money and, and they have to train them as well. So make it a dollar, you know, a dollar for your first week. I don't know. Uh, if you're, then it's $2, then it's 3 then it's 4 then it's 5 I mean, earn, earn your keep. Okay. So, but again, can government provide training or I don't know. Uh, but as you see the $15 minimum wage kick in, now you see kiosks. I use fast food apps like the McDonald's app and the kiosk more than I want to speak to the humans. So now they hire less people. So now it's less kids or poor people being able to get any kind of job. So now they get no training. They don't network and socialize with others. They stay home. They collect unemployment. They do drugs because they get bummed. They hang with the wrong people. They lose the spark of life. So is that better? I don't think so. Um, we need to stop equating working ourselves to exhaustion with success. Amen. Work hours went up during our government's idiotic dictatorial COVID shutdown. That's my ad living there, but uh, that is from the book that work hours went up during COVID. Uh, people were freaked out. Okay. We must work together to change the rules. Amen. Things seem fixed and unchangeable. So fixed as in dug in. They seem, you know, unchangeable until they change. France created a right to disconnect. So that was interesting when I read about that. The point is you are entitled to clearly defined work hours. And uh, I agree with that. Our deteriorating diets and rising pollution. We eat like crap. Yes. Our energy spikes and it crashes. Yes. Then brain fog. Add in caffeine, it gets amplified. We're deprived of the nutrients our brains need to develop and function properly. Ultra processed food is terrible for us. You know, and I've really been paying attention to this for the last year, especially the last six months when I was traveling last week, seeing what they were feeding everyone. It just, oh, it hurt my soul. You know, I just ate a lot of protein, um, 
you know, no desserts, no uh, very few carbs, a little bit of the bread, but just, I mean, a, a third, a quarter of what I would normally eat. I didn't have the crash, uh, but everybody complains of it. And then right after lunch, you know, they, they keep coffee out, iced tea, they bring out cookies and cake, and then they brought out more snacks, like literally candy bars. I'm like, oh my gosh. Ugh. <clears throat> anyway, 70% of kids who eliminated crap increased their attention by 50%. These, quote, foods have chemicals that act like drugs and make kids hyperactive. Refined carbohydrates, processed food, and junk oils are killing us and our kids. The stuff in the middle of the grocery store is not food. I would even argue you don't need the vegetables. I've been doing more of the carnivore diet and feel better, more energy. My cholesterol came down 30 points in the last six months eating like this. But anyway, um, you try to eat well, and an army of marketers is trying to stop you from doing so. A Canadian study found that you're 15% more likely to develop dementia if you live within 50 meters of a major road. Right? Air pollution affects children even more, which makes sense. Lead has been known to be terrible for us for thousands of years, yet GM put it into gas in 1925, calling it a, quote, gift from God. Dusting your home and washing your hands won't help stop lead poisoning, as they recommended. The poor were disproportionately affected. Industry creates diversionary tactics to boost profits. Always have, always will. The health issues you have are not always your fault. The IQ of the average preschooler has now risen five points. Our blood level, our blood lead level is now at 0 0.85 micrograms versus 15 micrograms per deciliter since 1975. So all this is because of the reduced lead. Pesticides, plastics, PCBs, BPAs, flame retardants, cosmetics are all bad for us. Endocrine disruptors are everywhere. Chemicals are now assumed to be safe until proven otherwise. We need to flip that script. Next chapter, the rise of ADHD and how we are responding to it. Between 2003 and 2011, ADHD diagnoses have increased 43% overall, 55% among girls. 13% of adolescents have been given this diagnosis and a lot of powerful drugs to combat it. Is ADHD biological? All agree that it is real, but what is its source? The market for stimulants is at least $10 billion. Veterinarian Nicholas Dodman prescribed Ritalin to dogs in the 90s. He discovered it by accident when treating a horse in the 80s for cribbing, which affects 8% of horses who are locked up all day. Right, it's where they, they're chewing things, like maybe their lip or wood or whatever. Uh, they're locked up. He gave pacing bears Prozac. Parrots are on Xanax and Valium. Wild horses don't crib. These locked up horses are suffering from frustrated biological order. Remember that phrase, frustrated biological order. Dr. Sammy Timmy is looking into the lives of his young patients and is reducing the ADHD meds his predecessor doled out. Kids no longer play outside and they're fed crap. They live in pollution-ridden cities. When a child had his dad come back into his life, he started acting better. <gasps> Shocking, right? When a, quote, bad child got into a good school without the chaotic teacher, he improved. Wow. ADHD is not a diagnosis. Why is what you must uncover. A child's environment is the most important determinant in them developing ADHD symptoms, their environment. Stressed out parents can't soothe a worked up child. They give meth addicts a similar drug as Ritalin to help them break their addictions. These stimulants can stunt the growth of children and lead to heart problems, but we don't really know the long-term effects. Stimulants help kids with repetitive tasks, but not with learning. They reduce your sleep. Twin studies, so actually studying twins, like identical twins, is the source of most of the stats we have on biological versus environmental, but it's an unreliable scientific method. 
Genes don't operate in a vacuum. They are turned on and off in response to environmental input. According to Alan Srauf, Srauf, our experiences literally get under our skin. Professor Joel Nigg. So I'll let you do your own research on twin studies, but he, he backed it up. So it's interesting. Uh, last two chapters, the confinement of our children, both physically and psychologically. Children need to be allowed to play without helicopter parenting. By 2003, only 10% of U.S. children spent any time playing freely outdoors regularly. Now they drill and prepare for tests. Free play and recess are going away. Lenore Skenazi walked alone to school in the 60s as a five-year-old. In the 90s, she was expected to escort her children to school. Kids are meant to wake up early, go outside with their friends, and play all day. She became, quote, America's worst mom for allowing her nine-year-old son to take the subway home alone. Her crime was not living in fear for her kids. Now, Sesame Street episodes from the late 60s have warnings on them since they show young kids walking alone outside, talking to strangers, and playing in vacant lots. Attention improves when we exercise. I talked about Caesar Milan, the dog whisperer, Caesar's way. He always talked about exercise discipline, then affection. So first thing he would do when he showed up, he put, he put these little roller blades on his tennis shoes and let the dog pull them. So in the military, wake your asses up, right? Go for a run. When you're tired, now you're open to learning new things. You're not going to resist it as much. Then when you perform well, you get some affection. Children learn vital skills when they play how to make something happen, be creative and imaginative, be persuasive, read people, negotiate, understand the needs and desires of others, cope with disappointment and frustration, cope with getting lost, being excluded, etc. Form social bonds, develop aliveness. Parents now take you to organize sports and essentially say, here's the environment. I've already mapped it out for you. Stop exploring. That's not good. Homework is exploding. Learning through play makes our brains more supple, plastic, and creative. Anxiety is exploding. Children don't learn to cope when you deprive them of unsupervised play. Intrinsic and extrinsic motivators. Intrinsic is better, but we're depriving children of the opportunity to develop intrinsic motivators. Learn to focus by finding something of interest. You need free time to figure out what is important and exciting and interesting to you. Let Grow was started by Lenore. One day a month or a week, a child's homework is to do something new without help or supervision and report on it. Small things build confidence. We need to let kids experiment and explore and experience. We have to chase to eat and hide. We have to chase to eat and hide to not be eaten until now. Let kids explore and expand. Lots of kids love learning but hate school, so stop drugging them. School focuses too much on testing. Amen. Diagnoses of severe attention problems in children rose 22% since Bush signed into law the No Child Left Behind Act in 2002. Hmm. Sudbury Valley School was started in the late 60s in Massachusetts with no teachers, classes, homework, curriculum, or tests. My own son was in the first graduating class of Minerva. Uh, for college, right? Look it up, minerva.edu. Very interesting. Kind of a similar model. Not, not, Not that extreme, but same vein. Kids who have been, quote, unschooled like this were more likely to go on to higher education. The modern school was designed in the 1870s to train children to be good factory workers. Play in rats make them have less fear and anxiety and increase their ability to solve new problems. In Berlin, all right, what is this? Eve Evangelisch School Berlin Zentrum, <laughs> something like that, created a similar model, but with a little more structure. Finland has no school until kids are seven. Amen. From seven to 16, school is only 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. with almost no homework, few tests, with 15 minutes of play after every 45 minutes of instruction. Sounds good to me. So he wraps it up with the attention rebellion. we got to rebel to get our attention back. 
his attention actually got worse during the COVID lockdown. So he, he admits that. James William, right? The, Williams, the former Google strategist, says we have several layers. He calls one the spotlight layer when you focus on immediate actions. Starlight layer when you focus on longer-term goals. When you feel lost, look up to your guiding lights, your north star. Daylight layer. This form of focus lets you know what your longer-term goals are in the first place. When you lose your daylight focus, it's the deepest form of distraction. You may begin what he calls decohering. This is when you stop making sense to yourself. You become obsessed with petty goals or dependent on simplistic signals from the outside world, like retweets. We are losing our light. We are living through a real-life denial of service. We are distracted or paralyzed. Six big changes that the author made, right? The pre-commitment, locking up his phone when he left, right? But the, just like Ulysses uh, in the Odyssey. Um, oh, I linked to this guy, uh, Mihail Zintmahali, helped him be easier on himself and gave him some tips on getting back into flow when he loses focus. He takes six months a year off of social media, usually in chunks. Uh, I'm thinking about how how I might do that, you know, maybe every other week. Um, but I see the benefit of that. But I have some groups. So I, I do marketing on it. I could certainly do like HubSpot lets me share posts directly from my blog. It keeps me off of the social media sites, but it is limited. Like I can't tag someone on LinkedIn. So, um, but I'm looking at ways to to be better. Uh, with this. Um, so experiment with taking some time off, uh, you know, and at a minimum, you could always just say, Hey, after 6 PM or after dinner or whatever, like no social media, you know, no social media six after 6 PM, maybe no social media until 10 AM or not until lunch, whatever. Right. See how that, that helps, uh, allow your mind to wander, be strict with getting a good night's sleep. Get eight hours of sleep, unwind before you go to bed. Don't look at screens for two hours prior to bed. Keep your room cool. Track your sleep with an app and a device that you like. I personally use my Apple Watch and the sleep app. Play freely with your kids. He plays with his nieces and nephews uh, or let them play unsupervised. Amen to that. So things to consider doing, and I agree with this, right? Cut out the processed foods. Eat more meat. Amen. Uh, I say eat fewer vegetables and salads, uh, meditate. I haven't done that. Maybe I'll try it. Take up slow practices like yoga. I don't know about that. I did. I have done yoga for a while and I liked it. Um, but jujitsu is my thing. So there we go. Take an extra day off each week. Okay. Not a bad idea if you can do it, right? Now, my phrasing, right, if our dictatorial government sycophants forced us to lock in on our devices and stay online and disconnected from human contact during the man-made COVID-19 virus and confinements, what else would they do to us, right? We had a 300% increase in searches for how to get your brain to focus. Your individual efforts are confronted with a broad environment that fight you everywhere you turn. Stress shatters attention. Our dictatorial government sycophants drove us in an accelerated fashion towards the future we fear into the arms of the surveillance capitalists, marketers, and out of the path of focus and attention. Now, that could be a good thing. Okay. In the U.S. in April 2020, we were spending 13 hours looking at a screen per day. The number of children looking at screens for more than six hours a day increased 6x and traffic to kids' apps tripled. We jumped into this virtual immersion a decade faster than planned by the tech giants. So that's the good thing, right? If we pay attention to the damage it is doing to us, then it's good. These sudden jolts make us pay attention versus the frog, which is slowly boiled to death. We saw our future as the screen new deal during the COVID lockdowns, and it hopefully scared us and woke us up. We need to organize and fight back. We need to nurture our attention and ourselves like we were taking care of a new houseplant. 
We can't take this for granted any longer. Fight back in three ways. Ban surveillance capitalism. Introduce a four-day work week. Rebuild childhood around letting kids play freely. Amen. Create a sight battle like Rosa Parks on the bus in Montgomery, Alabama, to tell the story about the wider problem. Very interesting. Greenpeace leaders broke into a coal-fired power station and painted on the building. So we'd go to trial and get more press. They put coal on trial and won since they proved their actions were due to an emergency. Get small groups motivated and raising awareness. This creates movements. We are free citizens who own our own minds. We need an attention rebellion. Amen. You don't get what you don't fight for. Since 1880, our world has been getting faster. The idea of economic growth made this happen. Companies grow by entering new markets or by getting existing consumers to buy more. As companies grow, i.e. make more money, they have more influence, i.e. they can buy the attention and the votes of lawmakers, which I already discussed. Our economies need more and more of our attention. They need us to move faster to switch between their show and their Instagram page so they can show us more ads. They need us exhausted and giving in. Dr. Jason Hickel is a proponent of steady state economies. Now, this is an interesting concept. I have not studied it. It makes sense to a degree, but I don't know. Um, I do know I'm a proponent of going back to the gold standard. Um, a target inflation by a Federal Reserve is crap. <clears throat> you know, I talked about lords of finances. Um, did a, an episode on that. Uh, a while back, I need to look that one up. Um, and you know, it was about the U.S., England, Germany, and France, the the leaders of their central reserves, the power they had, the messes they made. So you know, the Federal Reserve is neither federal nor is it a bank. Um, it's interesting. I think it's unconstitutional, but who am I? Um, so having you know, can you grow? I don't know. It's it's an interesting concept. You can make decent money, um, invest in other things to get started, make money that way uh, without going crazy, always focus on the growth. I don't know. But what we're doing isn't working that well. Oh, we're the greatest country in the, in the world. Like, really? Based on what? I think. I think our our founding is the greatest founding in the world. Our principles, our constitution, the Bill of Rights, those concepts are the greatest, but we've gotten away from them. So but I digress. Um, we must redefine prosperity from the ability to buy things we don't need or make us happy to spending more time with children and family, to be in nature, to dream, to sleep, to have secure work, to do Brazilian jiu-jitsu six days a week. Amen. Most of us don't want a fast life. We want a good life. I agree. COVID-19 did help us slow down for a moment. That's the unintended consequences of the assholes in government that brought this upon us. It may be impossible to rescue focus and attention, but we are being pushed to our limits. So we'll have to face this sooner rather than later. We must love one another or die. W.H. Auden, English poet at the start of World War II. If you need to get more done in this crazy world, check out my free program, 12 weeks to peak.com. All right, check that out. I've got a little link there as well. Come join us. All right. Time for dinner for me. So thanks for listening. I'll go sell something. <laughs>